The views and opinions expressed on America's Workforce Union podcast and its digital media channels are solely those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of the producers or sponsors. Welcome to the America's Workforce Radio Podcast, the flagship production of the American Workers Radio and Podcast Network, where organized labor and its never-ending fight to protect the rights of the American worker come first. Now, presented by LIUNA, Laborers International Union of North America, here's your host, Ed Flash Ferrens. J.D. Vance crosses a picket line, so that makes him a scab, says the News Guild. Meanwhile, we're getting more insight as to why the machinists voted down the latest contract offer at Boeing. And today on the show, the latest from the International Brotherhood of Teamsters and the United Steelworkers. Welcome to the Friday, October 25th edition of America's Workforce, where we're available on at least five platforms, including YouTube, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Pandora. We have two guests on the show today. We're going to start things off with Jason Lopes. Jason is the healthcare director for the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. Now, often when you say Teamster, you think a truck driver. Well, the Teamsters, like many unions, have diversified over the years. And for the last two years, Jason has been the healthcare director of the Teamsters. He's also business agent for Local 25 out of Boston. That's a big local. And he's had that position for about 10 years now. Altogether, again, over two decades as a Teamster. We're going to talk about the national contract that Jason secured with his team at the American Red Cross. Growing worker power in the healthcare industries, especially in the nonprofit space. Different kind of organizing there. And we're going to talk about that with Jason. And with the Red Cross, they were drawing blood, the workers drawing blood, and there's safety issues. And during the pandemic, that came to their attention that these workers needed a better deal. And they got it with the Teamsters. We'll talk about the details in that contract, and we'll talk about the healthcare industry in general, the union organizing going on. Right now, healthcare is the number one employer in the country. Used to be manufacturing, used to be steel, used to be cars. No, it's healthcare. I often said on the show, healthcare is the new steel. So Jason Lopes will be our first guest. Then we're going to go to uh, Donnie Blatt. Now, Donnie is the District 1 Director for the United Steelworkers. USW.org is a national website. He is in Michigan today. Ironically, he's going to talk about what happened in Michigan, hopefully happening in the state of Ohio. And that's all to do with Issue 1. Now, Issue 1, we've addressed this on the show many, many times. It's on the ballot in the state of Ohio, and it would pretty much put an end to gerrymandering. It would eliminate the Ohio Redistricting Commission which currently is made up of the governor, the auditor, the secretary of state, and four state lawmakers, two from each party. The amendment would create a 15-member panel made up of five Republicans, five Democrats, five independents, all selected by retired judges from both sides, okay? This would put an end to gerrymandering, and there's a lot of confusion in the wording but with all the boots on the ground that union brothers and sisters are uh, involved in right now, they're trying to get the word out on what this actually means. And that's what Donnie's going to talk about on the show as our second guest. And now a brief look into the world of labor. This segment brought to you by Boyd Watterson Asset Management, offering fixed income, real estate, and equity investment options to clients from coast to coast. You can find more at BoydWatterson.com. Vice presidential candidate J.D. Vance crossed a virtual picket line yesterday. How did he do it? By publishing an opinion piece in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, a newspaper that's been on strike for two years by their workers. John Schloys, president of the News Guild, CWA, said there was no excuse for Vance, the running mate, Donald Trump, not to be aware of the strike that just entered its third year. J.D. Vance, and this is John speaking, has crossed a very obvious picket line by striking Americans. And J.D. Vance is a scab. 
just like anybody else who crosses a picket line. Well, early yesterday, the Post-Gazette ran a piece under Vance's byline entitled Kamala Harris's Prejudice Against Catholics, in which he criticized the Democratic nominee for skipping the Al Smith dinner last week to campaign. Now, that dinner traditionally features a roast of both candidates and benefits Catholic charities. Now, Trump attended and, well, let me put it this way. He said a lot of nasty stuff. I'm not going to get into that. But the bottom line is this. Vance's piece does not appear to have run in any other publications. Beneath his byline, it reads, Special to the Post-Gazette. Now, the Trump campaign did not immediately respond yesterday when asked about the op-ed. Workers at the Post-Gazette have been on strike since October of 2022 in a very long-running battle with the owner, Block Communications. Now, the National Labor Relations Board, the federal agency that enforces collective bargaining law, has found that the company failed to bargain in good faith and illegally imposed new working conditions, leaving employees with higher health care costs and less vacation time. The Labor Board recently went to federal court seeking an injunction to force the company to the bargaining table, and the striking journalists from the paper have maintained their own strike publication, the Pittsburgh Union Progress, and they've asked other journalists not to cross the picket line by performing work for the Post-Gazette. Schloy said the picket line applies not only to professional reporters and editors, but to contributors like J.D. Vance, whether they are paid for their pieces or not. He went on to say, you can deliver that message to any other publication. Don't go to work for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Don't click on the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Don't share articles from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Amazing story. Amazing. We're going to have John on the show next week, by the way. Local union leaders in Seattle said 64% of the members of the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers who cast ballots on Wednesday voted against accepting that contract offer. We talked about this on the show yesterday. That latest offer rejected 35% over four years, but there's more to it. And uh, I found out some more of the details, the, uh, the sticking point. And Tom Buffenbarger referenced this a couple of days ago on the show, on the Tuesday show. But the major sticking point was the company's refusal to restore a traditional pension plan that was frozen about a decade ago. Larry Best is a customer quality coordinator with 38 years at Boeing. He said the pension should have been the top priority. We all said that was our top priority along with the wage. Now, now is the prime opportunity in a prime time to get our pension back, and we all need to stay out and dig our heels in. Then there's Teresa Pound. She's a 16-year veteran at Boeing. She also voted against the deal. She said the health plan has gotten more expensive and her expected pension benefits would not be enough, even when combined with a 401k retirement account. This is what she said. I have put more time in this place than I was ever required to. I have literally blood, sweat, and tears from working at this company. She's 37, by the way. I'm looking at working until I'm 70 because I have this possibility that I might not get to retire based on what's happening in the market. Now, mind you, this strike started September 13th and has served as an early test for Boeing's new CEO, Kelly Ortberg. In his first remarks to investors this week, he said that Boeing needs a fundamental culture change. He said the company leaders need to spend more time on factory floors to know what's going on and prevent the festering of issues and work better together to identify, fix, and understand the root cause. Isn't that something that should be going on anyway? In recent weeks, the CEO announced large-scale layoffs, about 17,000 people and a plan to raise enough cash to avoid a bankruptcy filing. Now, get this. Boeing has not had a profitable year 
since 2018. Charles Fromig, who's a mechanic who has worked at Boeing for 38 years, said, after the results were announced that the company needs to take care of its workers. And this is what he said. I feel sorry for the young people. I have spent my entire life here and I'm ready to go. But they deserve a pension and I deserve an increase. By the way, the last Boeing strike happened in 2008, went on for eight weeks. It cost the company $100 million a day in deferred revenue. The strike in 1995, that one lasted 10 weeks. We'll keep you posted. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, Jason Lopes, Healthcare Director for the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, coming up next. This is America's Workforce. It takes Lyuna to build North America's infrastructure. From roads and bridges to schools and skyscrapers, the men and women of Lyuna, the Laborers International Union of North America, build the projects we depend on. From constructing the Freedom Tower on the site of the former World Trade Center to untangling Washington, D.C.'s congested interstate, Lyuna members do the work that matters. Find out what it takes to be built by Lyuna at lyuna.org. That's L-I-U-N-A dot org. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the Heat and Frost Insulators Labor Management Cooperative Trust. Find out more at insulators.org forward slash LMCT. We're the nurses, firefighters, and claims representatives that help keep our government services running. We respond to natural disasters. We care for our nation's veterans. And we investigate discrimination in the workplace. We are federal and D.C. government workers. And we are proud to serve the American people. Working in more than 70 agencies across the government, we know we can fulfill our mission because our union has our back. Learn more at AFGE. Dot O-R-G. Paid for by the American Federation of Government Employees, AFL-CIO. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, where you can find more at teamster.org. There is unity and strength for workers. We are the USW. We are the USW. The The United United Steel Steel Workers. Workers. The largest industrial union in North America. We represent 850,000 members in In the the U.S., U.S., Canada, Canada, and and the the Caribbean. Caribbean. We work in metals, rubber, chemicals, paper, oil refining, atomic energy, and the service sector. We are steel workers, standing strong and fighting for what's right. America's Workforce is presented by the Labor's International Union of North America. Feel the power right now at liuna.org. This is America's Workforce. More shows available at awfradio.com. And remember, you can check us out on Facebook or follow us on X, formerly known as Twitter. That would be AWF Union Podcast, AWF Union Podcast. Let's go to uh, line number one. Joining us today is Jason Lopes. Jason is the healthcare director for the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, one of our proud sponsors here on America's Workforce. National website, teamsters.org. And we're here to talk about a national contract for the American Red Cross. Yeah, Teamsters are one of many unions, very, very diversified. I mean, there was a time when you said the word Teamster, we had thought a truck driver. Well, <laughs> those days are long gone, and a lot of unions have gone in that direction. Jason, welcome to America's Workforce. Thanks for uh, joining us today. And when I have a new guest like yourself on the show, I'd like to get a little background on how you got involved in the Teamsters. I see you're uh, 20 plus years as a member. Talk to me about that part and we'll, then we'll talk about the uh, the new contract for the uh, the American Red Cross. Go ahead, my brother. Oh, good afternoon. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be on. Um, as you stated, a 21 year Teamster uh, out of the Boston, Massachusetts area. I uh, started my career in the warehousing industry, actually. I was an order picker and forklift operator for a stop and shop supermarket, so here in the Northeast. I was a chief steward and a shop steward for a couple of years, and that's when I got a phone call from now general president of the Teamster, Sean M. O'Brien, and uh, he offered me a spot as a business agent uh, working for the local back in 2014 through becoming a business agent and being more involved and getting national accounts like the American Red Cross. Uh, I then was offered a position in addition to my business agent role at Local 25 in the public services division. 
uh, representing members at the American Red Cross uh, and public sector employees and police officers and the like back in 2016. And uh, since then, I've had a couple of different hats that I've worn uh, representing the public services division and now in my current role as the healthcare director. Uh, representing uh, healthcare workers across the country, uh, nursing homes, hospitals, American Red Cross, EMS services, uh, so on and so forth. So uh, I've taken on a couple of different roles, but overall um, got involved through having an extremely active local union, having an extremely active leader like General President O'Brien, and uh, now under the guidance here in New England under uh, Tom Mari, who is the principal officer of Local 25 now and the head of the Joint Council. So uh, I've been privileged to uh, serve the membership now in one way, shape, or form as either a steward or a business agent for about 16 years total uh, in a leadership capacity. So being fortunate to be from Massachusetts as well, where we have very uh, worker-friendly laws and closed work state, uh, you know, I I benefit from those as well, but have uh, definitely had my eyes opened across the country as I deal with right to work states and helping members from across the country. So it's a rewarding and fulfilling job to say the least. Boy, I hear you about the right to work states. And, you know, I talk to our brothers in, and sisters in various states and, and they have a tough time. I, I was talking about the UAW not too long ago about uh, organizing at the Mercedes plant. And that's when you have a group of politicians that do everything possible to come down on the union like like they're the the evilest thing that ever that ever walked the earth. I mean, it's amazing how they treat how they treat unions in various states. So you're very fortunate there in the state of Massachusetts. And I congratulate the Teamsters. I had a story here recently about the uh, the organizing that's been going on under uh, Sean O'Brien. So I mean, hundreds of thousands of members have joined the Teamsters and, and healthcare. Let, let's zero in, obviously healthcare director. And I heard also that I guess the field of healthcare is like the number one employer in America today. I mean, it used to be auto, used to be steel, but the the economy has changed and the, the population is aging dramatically. And obviously we need, <laughs> we need a lot of people to work in healthcare and we want to make sure they're treated properly. So do you have a count on how many people right now in in the healthcare division that the Teamsters represent, Jason? Uh, so in the so the healthcare division is kind of a subset of the public services division. We are the second largest division in the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, behind the package division, which represents UPS. Uh, in the public services division, we have about a quarter of a million members total. Out of that, uh, between sixty and seventy thousand are healthcare workers currently. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, those healthcare workers were champions of the pandemic and the COVID outbreak. And, you know, everyone wanted to pat them on the back. But right now we're having some of our biggest struggles in these same arenas, uh, trying to hold some of these companies accountable who profited greatly during COVID off the backs of our members, but don't want to give them that recognition at the bargaining table. So you've probably seen, you know, a growing number of strike activities and, you know, job standouts and actions in regards to that, because some of these employers are just bad actors. Yeah. So it's been it's been a trying couple of years for our members in the healthcare division, um, and right now it's time for us to uh, take action and take what's ours. Well, let's talk about that a little bit later. First, I want to get into this national contract that you uh, secured with uh, with the American Red Cross, and I know it wasn't e- <laughs> they're never easy. Let's be honest about that. But uh, talk to me about uh, about the contract, some of the specifics, how you're able to accomplish it. I'll just turn it over to you, Jason. Go ahead. All right. So we were able to uh, secure a great four-year contract for our members at the American Red Cross, where we represent members across uh, 30 different states uh, in the country. We've been extremely successful negotiating this contract, which became a national agreement back in 2015. Uh, The Teamsters were part of a coalition of 11 different international unions who were approached by the company back in 2015 uh, because they were just in financial distress. Uh, We were looking at losing a lot of members, a lot of good jobs were going to be lost. And we were able to come together and form a coalition of unions to negotiate a national agreement. That went well uh, at first. It was bumpy. Uh, it's, It's hard enough to get all Teamsters on the same page, never mind 11 different international unions with different agendas. 
we navigated those bumpy roads for a while until we made a decision back in 2021 that we felt we'd be better off on our own uh, as Teamsters. Mm -hmm. So in 2021, uh, we separated from that coalition and we formed a Teamster only national agreement representing over 60 bargaining units Teamster only in that time frame. Now, uh, this is the first successor agreement for the Teamster only part of that national contract where we were able to secure tremendous wage increases, uh, some in some areas upwards of over 15 to 17% wage increases. We were able to negotiate an increase to the retirement fund uh, 401k match up to 6% of an employee's salary. So that was a, a good jump from the 4% that was current up to 6%. We were able to secure a great Teamster health insurance, which is really the crown jewel of the national agreement. So we were able to get team care health insurance for all of our members nationwide, which is going to save folks ten, fifteen thousand dollars a year in healthcare costs. Co-payment shares with the company went up. So the company is paying more of the weekly premium than they were in the past. So they're now paying 80-20 for a family plan and 90-10 for a single plan, which is a, a really good cost sharing split for our members at the Red Cross. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, a neutrality agreement in the national agreement, which allows us to be extremely aggressive with our organizing, both internal and external. So uh, since General President O'Brien and General Secretary Treasurer Zuckerman took over in 2022, they have given us the resources and just dedicated everything they can to this organizing push nationwide, which you had mentioned. Uh, hundreds of thousands of members joining the Teamsters, and there's no shortage of that at the American Red Cross. Uh, since the the new leadership took over in 2022, we have won 50 elections at the Red Cross in just under two years, uh, adding almost 600 new members to our ranks uh, at the Red Cross, which is around 2,000 currently. You know, with the resources and the team that they have supplied the division with uh, under the leadership of organizing director Chris Roselle as well as our regional organizers like Wayman Hawk. You know, I can't say enough about our team and the resources that the IBT is dedicated to helping these members and giving us the tools that we need to succeed in getting these strong contracts. And again, we're talking a four-year contract. Did I hear that correctly? Yes, yes. So with this current agreement, which started uh, October 1st of this year, is going to go for four years uh, through 2028, which is good uh you know, security for our members as well. Uh, the, the agreements in the past have been three years. Um, we were seeking a longer deal if we could get the numbers to match. And, you know, we were able to secure good wage increases and lock in health insurance cost savings that are just tremendous. So under this new contract, uh, members in 2028, the last year of the contract, will actually be paying less for their health insurance than they did in 2023. Mm -hmm. So that's unheard of in just about any industry. So that was a huge win for us. Jason, I want to point out here that the American Red Cross is a nonprofit. With that being said, and I know there's a lot of organizing going on in nonprofits, and, and they're achieving some pretty decent contracts like the Teamsters did here. Was that at all difficult when, uh, when you were doing these negotiations? Because, well, there's only so much money that goes around. You follow me on that? Absolutely. I mean, there's definitely obstacles when you're negotiating with a nonprofit versus a, a giant conglomerate like a UPS or a DHL. But there's two sides to the Red Cross that I don't think a lot of people understand. So you have your humanitarian side, which is mostly driven through donations. Uh, when you see a natural disaster, such as the hurricanes that we just had down in Florida and North Carolina, which devastated those areas, you see your commercials on TV asking for donations. That's one side of the Red Cross, the humanitarian business. Then you have what we represent, which is the biomedical side. That's what I call the blood sport. A lot of people don't understand is that when you go donate a pint of blood, that pint of blood gets processed, tested, different products are taken out of that blood, plasma, they irradiate the blood. There's different levels and different products that get produced out of your donation. But those donations are then sold to medical facilities. So although the Red Cross may be a nonprofit, they are driving business and it, it's a competitive market. Uh, you see a lot of these for-profit blood centers coming into areas like a CSL plasma 
stuff like that, where you'll see them in shopping malls and they'll be advertising $500 for your donation. Red Cross is actually in competition with these companies for your products to be able to sell them to, you know, the hospitals, specialty services, testing, colleges who are, you know, medical facilities who are uh, doing testing and stuff like that. So while it's a unique business and they are a nonprofit, there also is a driver on how much money they bring in and the revenue streams that they do have. Uh, Although they operate under one umbrella, there's kind of two sides to the business. Okay. Thanks for the clarity on that. So it's the biomedical division of the American Red Cross. Jason, I got to take a quick break here. I I mentioned uh, organizing in healthcare. I want to do that in the next segment. Jason Lopes joining us in our live line from Boston, Massachusetts. He's a business agent for Teamsters Local 25. Teamster.org is a national website. We'll continue right after this on America's Workforce. You're listening to America's Workforce with Ed Flash Ferrans. It takes Lyuna to power North America with affordable energy. The men and women of Lyuna, the Laborers International Union of North America, have the skills needed to build and maintain oil, natural gas, nuclear, solar, and wind projects that are shaping America's energy future. From new energy tech to retrofitted facilities, Lyuna members do it all. Find out what it takes to be powered by Lyuna at Lyuna.org. That's L-I-U-N-A dot org. This segment of the show is brought to you by the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way Employees Division of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. For more information, please visit bmwe.org. The Iron Workers Great Lakes District Council, consisting of eight iron worker local unions in West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Michigan. We build the skylines and bridges along the Great Lakes. With more work than ever before, the Great Lakes District Council is actively searching out the next great iron worker. Whether it's building the next Intel plant or constructing a bridge to safely connect our great cities along the lake. So join the Iron Workers Great Lakes District Council today. Find out how and learn more about the council by visiting IWDistrictCouncil.com. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the International Federation of Professional and Technical Engineers. You can find more at ifpte.org. Melwood is a dynamic nonprofit organization providing jobs and great opportunities for people with disabilities. And they do this through strategic partnerships with the federal government, unions, and community partners. Melwood is all about advancing economic independence for workers with disabilities, and they've been doing this for more than 60 years in Washington, D.C. and the surrounding area. Learn more about Melwood by visiting their website, melwood.org. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the Communication Workers of America. You can find more at cwa-union.org. The Alliance for American Manufacturing is a nonprofit, nonpartisan partnership formed back in 2007 by some of America's leading manufacturers and the United Steelworkers. Their mission is simple, strengthen American manufacturing and create new private sector jobs through smart public policies. Key word there is smart. We need to be smarter than ever in today's highly competitive world. The Alliance for American Manufacturing believes that an innovative and growing manufacturing base is vital to America's economic and national security, as well as providing good jobs for future generations. Good jobs today, good jobs tomorrow. Good American jobs. Find out more at AmericanManufacturing.org. Now, back to Ed Flash Ferrens with America's Workforce. And don't forget, you can check us out on at least five platforms. That includes YouTube, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Pandora. And when you get an opportunity, here's what you do. Just sign up, receive our shows on a regular basis, and give us a rating. We always appreciate those five-star ratings, so please keep them coming. Let's go back to our live line rejoin. Jason Lopes, he is the healthcare director for the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. Teamsters.org is a national website. He is the business agent. For Local 25 in Boston, Massachusetts. That's where you hear that accent from him. TeamstersLocal25.com is their website. And I take it you are uh, you were good friends with uh, Marty, or should I say Marty Walsh, the former U.S. Labor Secretary, Jason? Is that is that the case? Yeah, Marty is well, very well known to us here at Local 25 in Boston. Uh, I know him and uh, Sean O'Brien were very good friends over the years. I was able to meet Marty on a couple of different occasions. 
uh, supporting his campaigns and then in his work as the uh, Secretary of Labor before he moved on to the NHL Players Association. You know, always good to have a supporter like Marty's and uh, a strong union voice, uh, not only a rank and file member before he joined the political world, but he didn't forget where he came from, which is the most important part when we get people into the political realm. Sometimes they forget where they came from, and Marty definitely did not. Yeah, Marty, a great guy, also solid union, 100% union. He comes from LIUNA, Labor's International Union of North America, LIUNA.org, again, our presenting sponsor. But we're talking Teamster issues right now. And uh, one thing about the Biden administration, they hit the ground running. This was one president who was not afraid to say the word union. And it shows we're seeing a lot of union elections that just jumped up in the last year, the last couple of years with Biden. And I want to talk about organizing in the healthcare industry. We touched on this briefly in the first segment. And um, this is an industry that is growing by leaps and bounds. And a, a big part of that is people getting older here. They're going to need health care. And health care, well, it's pretty darn expensive. And you know that all too well when you negotiate those contracts. So, Jason, with that being said, I wonder if you could paint a picture of what you see moving forward with the healthcare industry, especially how the Teamsters are going to fit into that. Go ahead. Well, we have a lot of opportunity in the healthcare industry to grow our rank and file. Um, right now, you know, you think about Teamsters, like you said earlier, and you don't think nursing, you don't think healthcare, you don't think nursing homes and patient care and EMS and paramedics. But this has been one of the areas we've been able to be very aggressive in our organizing and helping people realize that we're not just truck drivers, we're not just warehousemen, that we do have the expertise and the knowledge and the ability to come in and help in the healthcare realm. Um, I'm glad that you're emphasizing the organizing because right now, not only with our neutrality agreement at the Red Cross, which has uh, allowed us to win over 50 elections in less than two years, but we have a gigantic organizing drive currently going on in the state of Michigan with Corwell Health for over 8,000 nurses those nurses are currently attempting to get to an NLRB election in spite of the company's best efforts and the millions of dollars that they've thrown at us in anti-union rhetoric and captive audience meetings. And, and, and despite their best efforts, we have overwhelming support from these nurses who are just tired of the staffing shortages, the excuses. You know, these companies have no problem paying travel nurses two, three times what they're paying our, our prospective members for wages to fly them in, get them from out of town, but they don't want to take care of their own. Those same people who carried them through the pandemic, who came to work every day and risked their own lives for the safety and the health of others. And it's, it's disappointing, but that's where the Teamsters come in. We can be that voice. We can be that support system. And we can be those ones that help you get that voice in the workplace, get what you deserve and hold that employer accountable. So big shout out to our 8,000 nurses at Corwell Health who are soon to be Teamsters as soon as the NLRB gets us that date for the election. Uh, we have some locals up there, uh, Local 337 and the Joint Council up there in, in Michigan has been working their butts off with this organizing drive uh, through eight different facilities, uh, 8,000 nurses. So um, that's that's a great high, a great point to highlight on what we can do in the healthcare industry moving forward. Well, the fact that it's Michigan, your timing couldn't be better considering the political climate there. And in fact, I talked recently with the Ron Bieber, the state Fed president over there in Michigan, and uh, things have changed dramatically. I mean, they're 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 getting collective bargaining rights for, for some workers that they didn't have under the previous governor. And, and, you know, right to work is no longer part of Michigan anymore. And so that's got that's got to help you being being the fact that they're no longer a right to work state. Don't you think that that's going to make this a little bit easier? Oh, it's huge. It's huge. And it, and it definitely helps once the group is organized to build that strength from within. You don't have the fracturing of the groups. You don't have the member versus non-member aspect. So, you know, those hurdles that you have to deal with in the right to work states. And I envy our agents and officers and all of our organizers who do the tremendous work in these right to work states to cultivate our membership and to inform the members on why they should join the union and why it's the right thing to do and the things we can do to help because 
membership is the power, right? I can't walk in and negotiate these great contracts that we're getting if the company knows only 30% of the members are behind me. So when people rally together, they show their support and they give the union the tools, then we can't be stopped. So, yeah. you know, Michigan no longer being right to work is a huge part of this process. And I just think that that combined with the poor behavior of these companies and just continuing to beat down these employees, they've just had enough. And yeah. Teamster representation is definitely the right way for them to go. Now, let me throw one more at you. Organizing in the South here, and we've had an, a number of conversations, and, and Alabama, for one, is picking up. Uh, they're, uh, they're probably more union than three or four of those states combined over there. I mean, talking about uh, like Louisiana, parts of Texas and, and that area, even Tennessee. Tennessee has right to work enshrined in their constitution. Are the Teamsters, the Teamsters, you want to call attention to anything that's going down in that area right now, or is it kind of premature for that right now? It's a little premature on the uh, overall global aspect of the healthcare organizing in that uh, part of the country. But I can tell you that we did win several elections uh, in Dallas, Texas, two different parts of Tennessee, mainly uh, the bigger group being in Nashville. And we just won a couple of elections in South Carolina and in Georgia with the American Red Cross. So we are uh, active in the South um, and we are cultivating those areas as as definite target areas which are uh, untapped potential so uh, we are exhausting some resources we just had a really good internal organizing drive in florida which as you know is right to work where we doubled our membership in one hospital uh over the course of a month and a half internal organizing drive so um you know this this leadership team at the international is committed to the organizing and they've spent the money they put their money where their mouth is with the resources and we've got teams in all of these areas with the internal organizing, especially what we like to call the low hanging fruit Yeah, where we already have contracts. We already have members, but we need to get those that are on board on board. And the climate is definitely changing in the South in, in a lot of these areas. So for us to double our membership in one hospital down in Florida goes to show you that people's mindsets are changing when it comes to unions. Wow, that's amazing. Jason, congratulations on that. That is monumental, especially in the state of Florida, which is it's been a real tough state under Ron DeSantis. Let's be honest about that. Jason Lopes, who is the healthcare director for the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, obviously on a roll here. He's with Local 25 out of Boston, 13,000 strong, over a million strong on the national level. He serves as business agent for Local 25 in Boston, Massachusetts. Jason, thank you so much. You added a lot to the show today. Let's stay in touch on all the organizing that you're doing because that message needs to get out there, and this show is the way to convey it. Okay, my brother? Thanks again for having me. I appreciate the opportunity, and hopefully we can talk again soon. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Donnie Blatt, District 1 Director for the United Steelworkers, talking about Issue 1 in the state of Ohio. That story right after this. This is America's Workforce. America's Workforce is sponsored in part by Boyd Watterson Asset Management, LLC. Find out more about our investment solutions tailored to meet the needs of Taft-Hartley funds at BoydWatterson.com. It takes Lyuna to keep America running. Over 70,000 public employees are part of Lyuna, the Laborers International Union of North America, delivering critical services such as health care and emergency response, as well as maintaining roads and sanitation systems. Even the National Postal Mail Handlers Union, representing over 47,000 U.S. postal workers, is affiliated with Lyuna. Find out what it takes for Lyuna to keep America running at lyuna.org. That's L-I-U-N-A dot org. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the United Steelworkers. You can find more at usw.org. America's Workforce appreciates our sponsor, the Columbus Central Ohio Building and Construction Trades Council, who represents more than 18,000 workers from 19 affiliated local unions and district councils. Melwood, advancing economic independence for workers with disabilities for more than 60 years. Learn more by visiting melwood.org. Are you an experienced mechanical insulator looking to take your career to the next level? Insulators Local 50 in Central Ohio has steady work for a number of years. Insulators Local 50 offers a total wage and benefits package that can't be beat. 
It's not just the competitive wages. Local 50 also provides medical, vision, and dental insurance with no paycheck deductions for you and your family. Don't miss out on the chance to secure your future. Join us at Insulators Local 50. Earn great pay and the best benefits. Visit insulators50.com forward slash AWF50 to fill out the online form and a Local 50 representative will call to begin the process. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the Iron Workers. You can find more at ironworkers.org. Now, back to America's Workforce. Here's Ed Flash Ferens. And don't forget, you can check us out on Facebook or follow us on X, formerly known as Twitter. That would be AWF Union Podcast, AWF Union Podcast. Let's go to line two. Welcome Donnie Blatt back to the show. Donnie is the director of District 1 of the United Steelworkers, which encompasses all of Ohio and all of Michigan. And what happened in Michigan a couple of years ago, well, we're trying to do that in Ohio. And we're talking about putting an end to gerrymandering. Donnie Blatt, welcome back to America's Workforce. Always a pleasure having you on. And it's always good to have the steelworkers because they're one of our National sponsors here, USW.org is a website, and I come from a steelworker family, so this is very near and dear to my heart. So uh, talk to me about issue one. Uh, We've been on this with the Ohio AFL-CIO for the past year, and the the former chief justice, who's a Republican from the Ohio Supreme Court, pretty much put all the language together, which... uh, (laughs) which was challenged, but nonetheless, it's being voted on as we speak. So, Donnie, talk to me about the campaign on Issue 1. It's all yours, brother. Thank you, Flash. Thanks for having me on the show again. I appreciate it. Hey, look, uh, uh, you are right about Issue 1. I just want to let you know I'm at our district conference, uh, our District 1 conference in Detroit right now, so thanks for allowing me to to get on the phone and do this. But Issue 1... In Ohio, and you are correct, they did this a couple of years ago in Michigan. They got the legislation to draw the fair maps and the transparent elections and have them fair elections. And that's how they were able to get rid of right to work for a state for the first time in, in 60 years. And so we're trying to do that in Ohio to make sure Ohio is the most gerrymandered state in the country. We've been trying to create these lines that are fair and just, um, that take into account the population and and culture and and really trying to give the elections back to the people having the people be able to vote for who represents them instead of having the representative choose who's going to vote for them and that's really what's going on in ohio right now so marine o'connor who was a republican chief justice for the supreme court is the one to put this language together the last set of lines that they drew on the maps was said to be unconstitutional seven times Mm -hmm. And the legislators just ignored us, ignored the courts, put the maps out anyway. And so this is a way to stop that. And this is a way for to really put the elections back in the hands of the people. Yeah, exactly. That's what we want. Voters are supposed to choose the politicians, not the other way around. And and, uh, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah. 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 And we saw what happened in Michigan here. In fact, we had Ron Bieber on the show who is the president of the Michigan AFL-CIO. He was on just a couple of days ago talking about the things that have happened as a result of getting rid of right to work. Now, we're we're not right to work here in the state of Ohio, and hopefully we never will be. But the bottom line is the makeup of Democrats and Republicans, we have a supermajority in the legislature, and it shouldn't be that way. It should not be that way. Yeah. Because, yeah, because the districts are carved like that. Let me ask you this, Donnie. What are you hearing? Because the language, and I remember talking about this with Tim Berga of the Ohio AFL-CIO. It's a little bit confusing. Yes. uh, By design, I might add. Yes. Uh, I'm wondering, what are you hearing from people that went to the polls already? What are they saying? Well, you know, uh, we've uh, we've had people go to the polls and have contacted us. And fortunately, uh, people have actually read the language of the ballot initiative uh, before they voted and would call us and ask us, you know, say, hey, you know, this is confusing. We need to know why we need to vote yes on this thing, because Frank LaRose uh, and some of the legislators that want to keep that power put together this confusing language about the uh, independent commission, the citizens commission that would be put together uh, to draw these lines and draw these maps, saying that they're not accountable to the electorate and, and all this other stuff. And 
I mean, it really isn't. It, it's not true. You know, they're going to be chosen by an independent panel of retired judges, two retired Republican judges and two re- retired Democrat judges. They're going to start choosing this panel and then they're going to have, there's going to be this whole process of people being able to put in resumes to be on this. And there'll be many resumes that they're going to choose from. And the whole thing is so transparent. People can actually go online, listen to the interviews, watch the process take place and know who actually know who the people are that are going to be part of this uh, independent commission of five Democrats, five Republicans and, and five independents. Mm hmm. Donnie, you mentioned um, educating voters, and, and that's that's what unions do. I mean, you know, put the facts, and, and you don't tell people how to vote. You don't do that. You tell them, here's the facts. This is what candidate A stands for. This is what candidate B stands for. And here's the facts on issue one. Here's where we are in Ohio, and this is how it can change. Talk to me about that campaign. Now, the United Steelworkers, they, like many unions, they have one hell of a ground game. Mm-hmm. Can you explain what's going on with that ground game to our listeners right now? Yeah, I sure can. Look, and, and we, we have uh, what we call our political casuals that are out in Michigan and in Ohio that are out uh, educating our members uh, on the issues. And that's really what we talk about. We talk about the issues that are important to us. Um, and why we ought to support those that support our issues. So we have people going door to door. We have people that are making phone calls. We're doing plant gate uh, leafleting and talking to folks as they're coming in now the different work sites and things like that. And look, we had this conversation uh, just the other day at our at our district conference. Flash and Ron Bieber and Tim Berger were both here, and they were they talked about the election and they talked about the issues and and how each one of the candidates stand for them and. We try to make our members understand. And I said to them, I said, look, I don't come to you and say, I know how to make steel whenever I know you're the one that makes the steel. You're the one that can do it or the glass or the rubber or whatever. I said, I have two guys here. Their job is to uh, talk to politicians and make sure that they support our core values. And I, I said, so they know how to do this and they know what they're talking about. They're telling you what they know. That's why we ought to be telling our members as well. Don't take your vote off one of these silly ass commercials that are out there. Talk to the people that know what's going on. Let them tell you and then do the research for yourself if you if you think you need to. Right. So that's really what we try to do with uh, with our campaigns. Well, you said it perfectly. Silly ass commercials. My God. <laughs> I just, yeah. And I know everybody. Crazy. Wants, everybody yeah. wants them to be over. I mean, yesterday, <laughs> yeah. a long time ago. Yeah. I mean, they're just they really are ridiculous. I mean, uh, yeah. some of the things that they said about Sherrod Brown and, and the things about Kamala Harris. And it's so it's so ridiculous. It's just hard for me to even believe that people would even think that some of this stuff happened that's on there. So. Yeah, I know. And I tell you, Donnie, you know, I've been in the media for a long time. I mean, too much, (laughs) too long, (laughs) too long, too long of a time. And, you know, there was a thing called the fairness doctrine going back. Reagan got rid of that Mm -hmm. when he was president. Yeah. And, And sadly, that's why we see what we see on television and on the Internet today. Yeah. Internet's different. They have different. There's no regulations pretty much on the Internet, but there used to be. When it comes to what you can say about somebody mm-hmm. in a in a political commercial, but all that is out the window, sadly, and, and it just confuses the voters. All, all that's gone. Yeah. yeah, you can say you can say anything you want. There's no repercussions for it. Just say anything. So, getting back to issue one here, how do you feel? How do you feel about it? I mean, you know, being on the ground and you you talk to your members every day. What what are they saying? They feel pretty good about what may transpire here. I feel good uh, that that it's going to pass. You know, of course. We have a lot of folks on the on on the other side there that have their vote no signs for issue one, and it's going to be because they want they want their people to retain their power. But once you sit down and have a conversation with somebody, even if they're not supporting Kamala Harris for president, if they're even if they're going to support Trump, if you sit down and talk to them about issue one, and we've done a lot of this, they get it and they understand it and they like the fact that the elections are going to be transparent and they're going to be fair and they're going to be those who represent us will be in our hands not them choosing us so people like that fact we just had to get through the the confusing ballot language and make sure they understood why it was a yes vote why it has to be yes 
So I feel good that, that it's going to pass. I'm I'm hoping that uh, if we continue to do this work for the next few days, that, that it will. Well, I'll leave it on that note. Donnie Blatt, District 1 Director for the United Steelworkers, one of the many proud sponsors here of America's Workforce National website, usw.org. A lot of good videos there you might want to check out about the steelworkers. You take care. Stay safe over there in Detroit, and uh, we'll be talking to you down the road. Okay, brother? Thank you, Flash. I appreciate you. And that'll be it for another edition of America's Workforce. Coming up on Monday, the National Association of Letter Carriers and a company called Union Shirts. That story and more. Until then, all of you have a safe and wonderful weekend. That concludes another episode of the America's Workforce Radio Podcast. Thanks for listening, and be sure to subscribe so you never miss a show. America's Workforce is a production of Labor Tools and BMA Media Group. Find out more information online at labortools.com.